polarization in British politics will be a debate about should we be doing a, a much closer relationship with America or not. And so I think the, the political debate in Britain will become one between pro-Trump Americans and anti-Trump uh, Americans and, and therefore um, pro-Europeans. This is the beginning of the end of Brexit, in my view, uh, the debate that is going to be unleashed by uh, a Trump presidency. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust for Education and Research. And I'll be talking today with our chair, John Stevens, about the result of the American presidential elections. Uh, John, I, I know you follow very closely American politics. Um, were, were you surprised by the result of the presidential election? Well, yes and no. Um, no, in the sense that it was quite clear that on the crucial issues in polling, namely the economy and immigration, Trump had a very secure lead, uh, really right from the start. But I was a bit surprised because I've always thought that there was a strong moral dimension in American politics and in the religiosity of American society. And that someone of Trump's record um, should actually be able to make it back to the White House um, is a little surprising. It does indicate a very fundamental change, I think, which has been building over time um, in the moral framework of American political discourse. Are there any lessons for European politicians, uh, both continental and British uh, European politicians, uh, about the way in which they can win elections in future or, or avoid getting defeated in elections? Well, I think there are two features um, of the American political scene which are also relevant in Europe. One is the growing inequality of society and the uh, differential impact of uh, contemporary economic structures uh, on various sections of the population. And in particular, uh, the importance of uh, people's perception of their economic circumstances rather than the overall performance. The American economy measured in GDP relative to its uh, competitors is actually doing very well. But that was not perceived by a very large section of the population uh, who were hit by cost of living rises, inflation and the rest. And the other thing is this growing issue of identity uh, in politics, national identity in politics. Uh, the American debate was about what it means to be an American, who are Americans, and how you protect American identity, in particular against foreign influences against immigrants. And that is also, of course, a debate going on in Europe. Um, what is a European identity, the growing saliency of immigration across European politics, including in the UK? Do you think right-wing politicians in, in Europe will be encouraged by, by Trump's victory and think that there are particular lessons for them to learn? Not really, because there is a very fundamental difference between the right in an Europe and the right in America. The right in Europe is actually fundamentally rather anti-American, uh, not just overall in geopolitical terms, but also in terms of its view of society. Europe is not fundamentally an immigrant society. European identity is based on deep historic roots. This is totally different from the situation in the United States, which is, of course, completely created by immigration. Let's turn to some of the specific uh, international flashpoints that might or might not be affected by Donald Trump's uh, election. Uh, what do you think will be his attitude, his real attitude, as opposed to his rhetorical attitude to, to Ukraine? Well, I think there is a misunderstanding about why Trump is uh, in favour of Russia uh, in the Ukraine dispute, which he is without question. And that is because his main target is China. And he believes that what the U US needs to do is to get Russia on side against China in the way that previously the US got China on side against Russia, which brought down the Soviet Union. And so that is his priority. Um, and I do believe that he's going to push for a settlement in Ukraine, which is likely to be uh, very disadvantageous to the Ukrainians, 
whether the Ukrainians go along with that, whether such a settlement can last, and whether Russia can be detached from China, having now become so dependent upon it in the course of this war, those are very open questions. The other great foreign policy issue, which, which does seem to have pay, played a role in, in some people's voting to the disadvantage of the Democrats, uh, is, is the Middle East. Um, what do you think um, Trump, Trump's will bring to the table um, in Gaza and um, Lebanon that uh, his predecessor didn't? Well, I think there is no question that Trump will support uh, an Israeli attempt to uh, extend uh, Israeli occupation fully to North Gaza, certainly perhaps the whole of Gaza. And above all, I think the issue will be the West Bank, which has always been at the heart of uh, Israel's perception of what it is really about. It is, after all, historically the uh, core of the ancient Israels. And uh, I think that is now an open question, that I think that there will be American support for uh, Israeli attempts to essentially uh, take over the West Bank. Now, how that is presented internationally and what impact that has on the rest of the Middle East is an open question. Um, I, I think this is perhaps also part of, of Trump's overriding obsession with China as the rival to America. And uh, the implications of the Middle East for uh, Chinese influence in Central Asia and also on the position that India takes towards uh, the Muslim world uh, to the West um, is also an important factor in that. So there, there are wider implications, but Israel, I think, will now be seeking and will have US support for uh, a full occupation of uh, the West Bank in particular. If that does happen, then, then that will obviously be something that uh, incurs considerable criticism from the United Nations. Um, how uh, different will the American attitude be towards international organizations such as the uh, uh, United Nations, NATO and the European Union under Trump? Well, and they're all very different. I think the um, the American contempt for the UN will increase under Trump um, and the powerlessness of the UN um, will thereby, thereby be enhanced. What that means for other groupings like the BRICS, notably, um, I think it will enhance that sense. There will be a greater degree of choosing sides, essentially, between China and the, the United States. And the question will be where Europe uh, fits into that, um, because Europe is obviously going to be very reluctant to break all trade relations with China and with the, the Chinese-influenced area of Asia. Um, and so this is going to be a, a, a major rift potentially developing. And this could be particularly problematic for the UK, which has uh, ambitions both to be trading with Europe, trading with Asia, and also trading and seeking perhaps a special trade relationship with the United States. Is such a thing going to be possible with Trump, a special trading relationship with the United States? I think it's very unlikely that Trump is interested in doing such a deal. And the Republican control of Congress is now complete. And I can't see much support for um, any trade deal that would be remotely acceptable or advantageous to the UK. I mean, any plausible trade deal with the US uh, would entail the evisceration of British agriculture and the reduction, essentially, of the City of London to as a sort of back office status, I mean, among other consequences. It would also force us to be choosing sides in uh, this overall uh, trade war, which the target of which for Trump is China. And um, that does pose very great difficulties. It'll mean that uh, um, the Americans will be requiring in return for a more advantageous trade treatment for the UK, that we don't do trade with the people who 
um, they are targeting above all the Chinese, but also possibly the European Union. Yeah. What do you think the implications of, of, of Trump's victory will be for domestic British politics? Uh, perhaps we can start with the with the right of the political spectrum, um, reform and the conservatives. Uh, what, what do you think will be the, the impact on them, perhaps particularly on reform and Farage of, um, of, of Trump's victory? Well, I think this does uh, give Farage uh, a huge platform and a huge uh, leverage because he will be seeking to sell the fact that he has got a special relationship with Trump, um, that he will be able to secure a trade deal that will make Brexit uh, economically viable. Um, I mean, he will be promising that. In my view, that is a promise that won't be cannot be fulfilled. I don't see how it can be. I don't see, given that he won't have any governmental position, how can he be in position to... Well, he will be I using mean, this as a platform for pushing reforms uh, interests vis-a-vis the Conservative Party. And I think the chances of Farage now um, effectively uh, dominating and taking over the Conservative Party are greatly enhanced by a Trump victory. And the question is, will there be a split in the Conservative Party between those who are prepared to go along with uh, and um, essentially an American, pro-American policy, pro-Trump policy led by Farage and those who will not wish to do that. And, and I, I think that tension is going to come to the fore very quickly. And I cannot see the Conservative Party surviving that tension. Uh, what about on, on the left? Um, uh, Tony Blair found it very difficult to sell to his party his association with and collaboration with George W. Bush. It seems to me that Starmer will find it infinitely more difficult to sell collaboration with Donald Trump to his party. Uh, what, what will, where will um, Todd Starmer end up um, in that equation, do you think? I, I agree. I think it is going to be extremely difficult. And I think Trump is going to essentially drive the Labour Party um, into a pro-European position. Um, I mean, it's... It, it, it's hoping to avoid this question. Um, and, and that, I think, is why one reason why there was so much enthusiasm for the prospect of a Harris presidency. Um, now they are confronted with a, a very stark choice. Uh, and it will be impossible, I think, for Starmer to take a, a, a strongly a pro-Trump line. Um, he, he certainly won't be able to get a, or won't seek uh, even a trade deal um, with uh, Trump's America. Uh, and that will be the polarization in British politics will be a debate about should we be doing a, a much closer relationship with America or not. And so I think the, the political debate in Britain will become one between pro, pro Trump Americans and anti uh, Trump Americans and, and therefore um, pro Europeans. This is the beginning of the end of Brexit, in my view, uh, the debate that is going to be unleashed by uh, a Trump presidency. I can see that um, may begin uh, on the defence field, and uh, there there is an overlap of interest, um, an emerging clear overlap of interest between the United Kingdom and, um, and the, our continental neighbours. And but will that lead to reintegration into the rest of the European Union structures, the single market, um, the customs union, the freedom of movement? How well, do you see that as working out? It's going to be very difficult because, uh, as we've discussed in, in previous videos, there is no slow halfway house route back into um, the, the EU. Um, it is a question of accepting a European destiny rather than uh, some other destiny, whether it be American or, or something else. Um, and that is a very difficult argument to have. But Trump has fired the starting gun on this debate. And we'll have to see where it's going to go. It's going to be a very rough ride. There's no question about that, because Britain is, uh, to a degree, that far exceeds that of other content, other European countries, genuinely split between looking across the Atlantic and looking across the Channel. And uh, this debate, once unleashed, will have all sorts of ramifications uh, and consequences. Um, it's going to be highly disruptive for the UK. 
Do you think there's any chance that, particularly as far as NATO is concerned, Trump's uh, bark will turn out to be worse than his bite? Um, NATO survived the first period of his op- him in office. Um, will he be able to survive pretty well intact the second period? Well, I come back to the point that it's wrong to see Trump truly as an isolationist, I think. His target is China. And his attitude towards Russia is because he hopes that Russia can be detached from China and turned against China. Uh, That's also what governs his attitude towards India, his attitude towards uh, a Pacific policy. And the question will be whether he thinks that Europe is capable of being corralled or will be useful in a confrontation with China or not. And this extends beyond the military field. It's also about uh, the continued status of the dollar as a global currency relative to the ambitions that China has via the BRICS and other entities of developing alternative payment systems to to that of the dollar. Um, So it will really boil down to how uh, the Europeans position themselves um, in this emerging confrontation between uh, China and and America and how Britain will fit into that. And um, in the defence field, at the moment, we have been talking about a pivot towards um, the Far East. We've got the AUKUS deal with Australia, for example. Um, It's not clear really where we lie in that position. Um, and the same is true of the, the economic field, because we, we clearly hope to have um, trade relations with China and with, with the Chinese sphere in East Asia. Um, but that may be um, increasingly difficult um, if uh, America pursues this confrontation with China. On the European mainland, if um, the United States substantially reduces its military aid to Ukraine, Um, Will the Europeans, including the United Kingdom, um, be able to step up their efforts uh, to make up to make up for what's lacking from the American side? Well, it depends whether one's focusing simply on support for Ukraine or the wider defense area. I think what is absolutely clear is that Trump has unleashed a debate in Europe about true strategic autonomy, and that is not primarily actually about conventional weapons. Um, It is about the nuclear deterrent. And so I think there is going to be some form of accord, um, focusing primarily on Germany and France initially, but with other countries involved, that will give Europe strategic autonomy in the nuclear field, because that is really what lies behind uh, the weakness of, and uncertainty of, of Europe in its dealings with Russia over Ukraine is the question of the reliability of the American nuclear umbrella. And that is what has held NATO together. That is why Europeans intervened uh, with the Americans in Afghanistan, uh, for example. It was to secure the American nuclear umbrella. And I think people will now, in Europe, now see that that is not uh, viable as a long-term position. And therefore, they will seek to do it on their own. How that happens and what the controls are for that um, could be a major motor of deeper European political integration. Because after all, you can't get more fundamental than defence and you can't get more fundamental in defence than nuclear deterrence. Like any prime minister and party party leader, uh, Keir Starmer clearly spends quite a lot of time um, thinking about the next election, the next general election. Um, do you think that the success of Trump in getting re-elected will lead him to fear that in 2028 he'll be facing Boris Johnson again uh, with the prospect that Boris Johnson might um, beat him and become the next prime minister? I think Boris Johnson is finished in British politics. The Farage is the man to watch um, on the right. And I think he now has a real chance of emerging reform with a large section of the Conservative Party and being the prime ministerial candidate um, opposite Starmer um, in 2028 or 2029. Um, Now, the question is, will such a platform that is essentially a pro-American one uh, and a 
uh, hardline capitalist one in many respects, although not exclusively, because um, Trump is a confusion between um, very hardline free market capitalism and a leveling up agenda, even though it is more rhetoric than reality. Uh, that is the sort of platform that that Farage will be putting forward, a, a, a J.D. Vance platform, in essence. Um, and the question is, will that be attractive to the British electorate? In my view, it won't be. But a lot will depend upon whether the, the part of the conservative tradition that doesn't go with reform um, is able to establish an identity in British politics. Uh, and that depends on, uh, on what attitude that tradition takes towards Europe in particular, if at the same time the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats are, are moving in that direction also in reaction to a Trump presidency. So I think uh, what Starmer will be looking, looking forward to now is the possibility of a combination in British politics, perhaps even a, eventually a, um, a, a survival via the possibility of coalition in order to shut out what is going to be a very serious challenge from a reform orientated uh, conservative stroke uh, reform um, uh, grouping uh, as his uh, principal opponent. Well, thank you very much. We've had plenty to talk about and the inauguration hasn't yet even taken place. I'm sure that the four years of Trump's presidency will give us material for, for many, many such discussions. Thank you very much indeed, John, and thank you to all our, our viewers and listeners. Uh, please follow us on our website, Federal Trust for Education and Research. Goodbye.